good morning today we shall begin a new chapter this is on solidification of pure metal metal is mostly used in its solid state and its structure depends on how it has solidified during the process of solidification so we shall look at it in little detail and under this we will cover the nature of cooling curve we have already talked about and during thermal analysis and during the process of solidification it will pass through a, a state when both liquid and solid will be coexisting and phase rule states uh, uh, defines how many phases or what are the variables which can control this. We will also introduce concept of free energy, entropy and surface energy. They are very important concept to understand the process of solidification. We will also explain why for solidification to proceed some amount of undercooling is necessary and the process of solidification is a time dependent process. There are two steps and these are called nucleation when a certain number of very small nuclei of solid will form in the liquid. We will look at it uh, energetics of nucleation and thereafter nucleation there is a time dependent growth process former this is probabilistic a stochastic in nature whereas this is a deterministic it will follow certain growth rules. We will make a distinction between homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation what they are and then we will also look at the constraints which are imposed on liquid metal during solidification and why the solidification proceeds uh, in a particular direction. And this has been used uh, to solve or, or, or to get particular desired properties and textures in materials. Now let us look at the cooling curve of a pure metal how does it look? So, at a particular temperature above its melting point, it is liquid. Structure of liquid uh, is quite different from that of solid. We have seen that solids are crystalline, atoms in solids they are arranged in a regular or a periodic fashion. Solids are incompressible, its bulk modulus is very high. In comparison to this liquids flow easily whereas solid it does not flow unless you apply certain stress it does not flow whereas liquid will flow of its own and it can take the shape of the container where you keep that is not so in case of a solid. This is primarily because the atoms are not as closely packed as in solid. Secondly, the atoms are more mobile and, uh, and you can see that atoms are arranged in a disordered fashion, but there may be some amount of short range ordering using X-ray diffraction technique. The density of packing also has been estimated. So, in case of solid we have seen that coordination number that maximum coordination number in metal that you can have is 12 in face centered cubic. Whereas, same metal which is in, has a in solid face centered cubic structure, if it gets converted to liquid possibly you would not have that 12 as the coordination number. Coordination number will be less than 12, but nevertheless still quite high maybe 10, 11. And when this liquid cools, say it will cool in a, and this plot temperature it can be a smooth curve like this and this will be primarily determined by the temperature of the metal 
and the surrounding and usually this follows the Newton's laws of cooling and that is why I have put it like this and when it reaches freezing point that is the time if some amount of solid forms then the two phases will coexist for certain length of time liquid and solid and during the solidification process it will release heat also and you will find that here for some time that cooling just stops it maintains a constant temperature until solidification process is complete and once this is completed then again the temperature keeps dropping. Now Gibbs phase rule uh, gives us a simple relationship between the number of phases that can coexist at a given condition experimental condition and normally experimental condition we mean say the temperature is 1 and maybe and the pressure and at which you are doing the experiment and usually for most practical applications this pressure will be 1 atmosphere. So, you have two control variable temperature and pressure and gives phase rule states it is like this P plus F equal to C plus 2 where P is the number of phases, C is the number of component. Now, in case of a pure metal the component that just one metal. So, number of component is 1 and F represents degree of freedom. So, basically it is number of control variable that you have basically here the control variables are temperature and pressure. Now, in this case when during the process of freezing you have two phases liquid and solid coexisting in that case number of phases are 2 and then if you substitute here you get degree of freedom is 1 and in fact this 1 degree of freedom means it is the pressure. So, this temperature freezing point or the melting point is fixed for any metal is fixed at a given pressure. If you change pressure of course, this melting point can change. So, at a constant pressure liquid and solid can coexist at a fixed temperature. So, this is the outcome I mean this is the prediction or what gives phase rule uh, status uh, states and this is applicable to even multi component system. Now, what is a phase diagram? Basically phase diagram is a graphical representation of the stability of phases in a single or multi component system at a given state and a state is defined in terms of control variable so, and usually uh, only two of these set out of temperature, pressure and volume only two you can control. So, and for most practical purposes we can control temperature and pressure. Now, let us look at the how uh, this uh, stability of a single uh, component system depends on pressure and temperature and this is shown over here this axis represent pressure this is temperature and you can have a pure metal say it can you can have three different state liquid solid and gas and this pressure temperature diagram gives us the regime in which the solid liquid or gas is stable which is shown here like this there are three important lines and these lines represent the equilibrium between solid and gas there, there is a possibility the solid can be transformed entirely to gas without going through this liquid route. Similarly, uh, uh, you have this line which represents the line in which which represents the equilibrium between solid and liquid and this line represents the two phase uh, equilibrium between two phases liquid and gas. And say suppose one atmosphere 
line intersects here. In that case, this is the freezing point of the metal and this is the boiling point of the metal. So, in and this particular point is a critical point which represents equilibrium between all three. So, that means under this condition all the three phases solid, liquid and gas can coexist. So, for a particular uh, for this particular case if you try and apply phase rule you find for the triple point the degree of freedom is 0. So, for any material any pure material uh, say water this is a fixed point and this is which is written over here this T naught is equal to point almost point 0 1 degree centigrade and pressure at that point is point naught naught 6 atmosphere. Now, let me introduce a concept of Gibbs free energy. This uh, if we put an analogy uh, this is some kind of potential say like uh, energy you know uh, you can uh, or let us say electricity flows from higher potential to lower potential. Similarly, any transformation uh, when it takes place that it will take place in a direction from a higher potential energy to a lower potential energy. And Gibbs free energy you can say it is an analogy it is something similar to chemical potential. And we know that from second law of therm thermodynamics that although the entire amount of mechanical work can be converted totally to heat but it is impossible to convert totally the heat into mechanical work. So, that means in a system there is always a part of the energy which is not accessible which you cannot transform and gives free energy it is a thermodynamic uh, parameter you can see that it determines stability of a phase any phase which has a lower free energy will be more stable and this is defined as G is the Gibbs free energy it is H means it is molar enthalpy minus T is the temperature in degree Kelvin times a term called entropy. The entropy is a measure of disorder and if you multiply this entropy by the temperature this gives a measure of energy which cannot be converted it is locked. So, whatever is the free energy is G is enthalpy minus T d uh, T times entropy and we use this expression primary uh, all uh, whenever there is a reaction taking place at a constant atmosphere and for most uh, practical uh, experiments or uh, processes the atmosphere uh, atmospheric pressure is constant and usually it is one atmosphere pressure. There is a differential way of representing this and uh, this is a simple thermodynamics principle say it, you can convert it and write in differential form that is d g and in, you can convert it in terms of a, a from enthalpy and entropy to pressure and temperature because these are the easily controllable variable. Then it comes out that d g incremental increase in uh, free energy is equal to V plus incremental uh, times incremental pressure minus S d T. Now, let us look at the process of solidification we are concerned with the stability relative stability of two phases one is solid another is liquid and if you try. So, this is a something try to plot uh, this is solid not entropy here this rep line represents the free energy as function of temperature for solid and this line represents free energy of liquid as function of temperature. Now, let us look at it at high temperature which has lower free energy it is liquid. So, higher temperature liquid is more stable and these two line intersect here. 
So, this is the freezing point or melting point. Below this, below this solid is more stable because it has lower free energy. So, you can visualize the process of transformation as a chemical reaction like this liquid to solid and they can coexist at this freezing point. Both can coexist at the freezing point. At that time, if we can use this expression, you can write two separate expression, one for liquid, another for solid. And if you equate the two, uh, okay. Uh, so, essentially what is happening is uh, does solidification begins immediately when it falls uh, comes below the freezing point. At freezing point this is 0, but what happens when a solid nucleus a, a nucleus of a solid forms a new surface is created and to create this surface you have to apply certain amount of energy. Where does it come from? What is the driving force? So, that means that energy has to be supplied and this can come from this chemical potential and this is possible only if you go down, I mean uh, under cool a bit, you cool it the system to a little lower temperature, then you have the solid has uh, less energy free energy than the liquid. So, there is a net energy transform, you know there is a net available energy is there which is used up in creating new surface. So, for the solidification to proceed you need some amount of under cooling and this is shown over here actual ideal curve we had initially shown, but here even if you leave it indefinitely at this temperature solidification will not begin unless you have enough energy to create new surface that the surface that is solid liquid surface is created. So, this is shown over here and once the solidification begins that latent it will raise the temperature back to the freezing point or melting temperature and here both liquid and solid will coexist until entire amount of liquid is transformed into solid and thereafter it will follow the normal Newton's law of cooling. Now, we had shown the, this phase diagram for a pure metal and uh, or a pure material and let us uh, look at the case of uh, water it freezes. There are three phases involved ice, water and vapor. Now, here look at this slope is it uh, see most cases the slope is positive whenever the transformation uh, is associated with increase in volume say ice to vapor, liquid water to steam or vapor it is accompanied by an increase in volume. So, the slope of this line whether it is here, here they are positive. Now, what happens? in this case. It is possible to go to use this concept of free energy to derive a relationship which will define, uh, which will say what is the effect of pressure on the freezing point of water or for any metal. And this is shown over here, if we equate, say if we go back, if we equate the two and uh, because both are equal at uh, freezing point. So, if you can equate the two and little bit of algebraic uh, simplification, you will be able to show that this is equal to delta d p d t equal to delta s that is change in entropy over change in volume. And you can multiply both numerator and denominator by the freezing temperature or melting point in degree Kelvin that is T times T and this is an energy which is enthalpy 
that is the enthalpy that, that is you can say this is the latent heat of transformation. Now, in case of this reaction water to ice here when this from water you get ice you have to extract heat. So, that means enthalpy is negative and we also know that this is when ice forms it is associated there is an associated expansion volume expansion. So, delta V is greater than 0. So, therefore, this is positive this is negative this slope is negative. So, in any cases such cases wherever uh, there is a reverse transformation change in volume then the slope will be negative. Now, let us look at this extend this concept to a very commonly used metal that is iron uh, commonly metal metallic material definitely is steel which is an alloy of iron and carbon and let us look at the phase diagram of pure iron. Now, pure iron uh, has can exist in solid state in differ uh, can have different crystal structures. So, for example, at low temperature it crystal structure is body centered cubic whereas, at intermediate temperature its crystal structure is face centered cubic and before melting again it tr gets transformed into a body centered cubic structure. So, therefore, in this particular case we expect uh, there are uh, several uh, not, not just three phases there are more than uh, the, uh, several phases are possible at least two additional phases are possible and how does these uh, equilibrium line will be represented in the phase diagram which is shown here and this I have just uh, reversed it basically as uh, you, you can do it anyway. So, I put the temperature as an engineer very often it is easy to visualize it like this we will uh, as we go uh, later part we look at multi component system we will always represent temperature along y axis. And here this axis represents pressure. Now, at higher temperature this is the region which is uh, gas phase or vapor phase of iron and depending on the temperature it can exist as I said at a low temperature it is a BCC form of iron and it is commonly known as alpha iron at intermediate temperature between 910 to 1400 iron has a crystal structure. Uh, iron a crystal structure is body centered cubic at 1400 it again transforms uh, sorry I, I, I think uh, there is a mistake here please correct this is face centered cubic and again here it gets transformed into a body centered cubic and finally, at the melting point 1539 there is a uh, it transforms into liquid. So, you have two additional lines although I have drawn it exactly uh, is a perfect horizontal there will be some amount of pressure depending on the volume change which are associated. I leave it to you to find out say here when uh, BCC changes to FCC there is an increase in volume. So, a decrease in volume FCC is more much more close back there is a decrease in volume. So, by heating you have a decrease in volume and try to find out what will be the slope it will be positive or negative. Similarly, here sub later on it again transforms from FCC to BCC. So, this will be associated with expansion this is here there is a contraction here there is expansion and here obviously from solid to liquid there is expansion. But nevertheless, this volume change is very small. So, therefore, I have that even if there is a some definite finite slope, uh, uh, it will be very slope will be very small. And from this, it is easily to it is easy to draw the cooling curve. Cooling curve will look like this. You will have say one step here when the liquid transforms to delta. Again, there will be 
this is a solid state transformation. Here the two phases at this temperature delta and gamma can coexist. Then again at 910 gamma and alpha the transformation gamma to alpha FCC to BCC transformation is taking place. Here also this is a fixed temperature where both these phases can coexist. Now let us uh, look at the concept of surface energy. What was mentioned that for solidification to proceed some amount of undercooling is a must. Now is it possible to make some rough estimate what is the order of the undercooling and how does it depend on the magnitude of surface energy. And this is uh, shown pictorially over here. Suppose in a liquid a nucleus of solid forms, we have for simplicity we have assumed that it has a shape of a sphere, a spherical nucleus. Later on we will see this is the most stable phase because this will have sphere has the minimum energy and this is a situation is uh, uh, this solid you know this type of uh, nucleation it is called homogeneous nucleation. There is no substrate it is forming inside the liquid and suppose it has a radius r. Then a new area is created and area surface area is equal to of a sphere is 4 pi r square. Now if it is Sir, sigma is the surface energy per unit area, then we can say that energy that is 4 pi r square times sigma, this is the energy which need to be supplied for making this nucleus stable. And this will come from the transformation of the chemical free energy that gives free energy and pictorially it is shown here. So, this is the melting point and here definitely no nucleation, no, no nucleus is stable, but if you undercool here you have this is the difference in free energy and let us say that delta F V this is the free energy per unit volume which is, it can provide and this times the volume of the sphere, this is the net energy which this chemical reaction can provide. And for stable nucleus to be stable, this transformation, this energy should be negative and which is a possibility. So, that means this clearly shows thermodynamically that undercooling is necessary for the nucleus to be stable. Now let us look at and try and find out what is the concept of critical nucleus size. Now this is the expression for the total energy that is uh, uh, of transformation and this is a strong function of the dimension of the nucleus. So this part proportional to r cube and the second part is proportional to r square and which is shown here. This is the surface energy increases like this, whereas this free energy per unit volume is decreases and since the power is cube, it decreases much more rapidly. So there is a possibility that total if you find out, if you add this and this, this will show a behavior like this. And what we say that if this energy hump, there is a peak energy, if this can be crossed then what happens that if the nucleus radius increases the energy will keep dropping. So therefore, uh, this process will be spontaneous. So for that nucleus to be stable and grow spontaneously this energy hump must be exceeded and this can easily be found out by finding at what size of the nucleus this is this free energy change is maximum. So, you differentiate this with respect to r so and then equate it to 0. In that case, you get the critical nucleus size to be twice sigma over 
delta F V that is free energy per unit volume. And you can substitute this back into this, you get what is the magnitude of this energy hump. So, this shows that higher the supercooling, the smaller is the critical nuclear size and also higher the supercooling, the height of this energy hump is lower. So, in a way you can say that if the supercooling is more, the reaction will be much more spontaneous, it can take place easily and so therefore, to get a finer grain size in the solidified material, you have to cool it fast, so that there is a higher degree of undercooling and the critical nucleus size is small. Other extreme, if you want to grow a single crystal, a very large crystal, then you have to use, you, you have to form I mean a very low and controlled supercooling, so that the critical size is large and then, uh, then you, it is possible to grow large single crystal. Now, it is also possible to extend this concept to find out the rate of nucleation and how that homogeneous nucleation here, the nucleus that has formed, it has formed within the liquid, not on any surface. So, therefore, this type of nucleation we say it is a homogeneous nucleation. A nucleation rate it is easily, I mean you can use this uh, uh, that re reaction rate theory, rate at which that uh, nucleation takes place. This is a frequency term. Uh, which is uh, u k t is that that Boltzmann that energy you divide by Planck's constant. This is the frequency factor, and this is the total frequency factor. But successful uh, frequency of uh, formation of number of nuclei out of this is the total number of attempts being made. This is then how many of this are becoming stable. That will depend on whether this can cover a uh, x. Uh, exceed or uh, overcome the energy hump. This is given by that Boltzmann statistics. You say that E is the energy of transformation over k t. So, here this energy of transformation means you go back uh, uh, to the previous, what you can see, you can substitute this over there. So, in this expression, all these are in molar quantity. So, what you do to find out this energy? you multiply the numerator and denominator by V square, which is the molar volume and then you get this is the molar free energy of transformation. And so, basically you can see that uh, it more clearly says that lower the activation hill, higher is the nucleation rate and finer is the structure. Now, apart from say this pictorially shows say some nucleus has formed. But uh, this is a concurrent process, nucleation and growth both take place simultaneously and this will keep growing and then finally, uh, when each grain it meets another grain. So, this growth in this direction is inhibited and what finally you will get a number of grains and each grain may have different orientation and which is shown by different color and this is a typical microstructure of a solid pure metal. You will have several grains, they are all differently oriented and what looking at the microstructure important parameter that you can find out is the grain size, the diameter of the grain size, shape. You can also try and find out what is the average number of boundary number of boundary per unit uh, per grain and average number as we will go down at the end of the lecture, you will see I will leave this as an exercise that if you look at microstructure, this will be some number between 5 and 6. And now, you can extend this uh, uh, orientation of this grain, if you try and represent on a standard projection, what will happen? So, let us try to put this uh, orientation that cube axis of each of these grains, where they will be located. 
Now, if it is a single grain, say we can say that okay, 1 cube axis is here, 0 0 1 is here, 1 0 0 is here, 0 1 1 uh, uh, 0 0 1 is here. But you have several of these. For the second one, it may not be at these three points, but may be somewhere here, here, here. Similarly, for this it will be at a different place. So, on the whole what you can say that these cube poles they will be uniformly distributed as shown here with the dots. Uh, I am sorry this dots are too fine I should have made it little bolder. So, basically they will be uniformly distributed whereas, if there is a preferred orientation somehow you can control the solidification that is it is forming almost a directionally solidified structure, then possible that all cube may be located he, he, here along this, along this, along this. So, you will have more density of such poles in these areas, whereas this portions will be vacant, there will be no dots, no poles pointed over here. Now, let us uh, look at this uh, heterogeneous and homogeneous nucleation. Now, in case of this heterogeneous and homogeneous, we talked about this homogeneous nucleation. In this case, the nucleus shape is uh, spherical, it takes place within the liquid and there is a distinct interface between solid and liquid and there is no substrate here. Suppose we put a substrate then on depending on the nature of the substrate, if a solid forms, you will have the surface energy interactions. So, surface energy or uh, uh, this as we said that sigma is the surface energy between liquid and uh, liquid and solid. So, suppose here this is the solid and surrounding is the liquid. So, this is sigma and this subtains an angle with respect to the substrate theta. Now, if you uh, and similarly there will be a separate surface energy between substrate and solid, substrate and solid also substrate and liquid. And in fact, if you can resolve these, these four shares should balance that is sigma cos theta plus this surface energy between this substrate and liquid, this should be equal to the surface energy between the substrate and solid, because solid it is forming here, which is op acting in the opposite direction. And usually whenever you have this kind of shape, that angle, in that case you can say that this solid, this liquid wets this substrate and here a stable nucleus can form. So, it will depend on the surface, it will be determined by the surface energy or particularly this contact angles. And if it is wettable, then the substrate is, is a, a favorable site for nucleation of solid and this is schematically shown say homogeneous nucleation. Here I have tried to show there is no wall, no interface. So, within the liquid which is in fact very difficult to reproduce and uh, uh, to carry out this experiment. Whereas, here you if you allow the metal to solidify in a container, so there is interface solid interface available here and nucleation will start from this end all these interfaces. So, this so that means heterogeneous nucleation needs less chemical potential the different the driving force for heterogeneous nucleation will be low, but it will depend on whether you have a favorable substrate or not. Now, a few points about the directional concept of directional solidification. When you allow a metal to solidify in a container, so the external cooling setup uh, will determine the how the structure or evolution of structure takes place in this solid and this is schematically shown here in this diagram. So, you have a container and let us say we can extract heat from one surface only. 
So, this is the solid part of the solid which has formed, this is the liquid and heat can flow only along this and as we know that when solidification takes place, heat has to be extracted. Now, in this particular case, this side that and heat can flow only if there is a favorable temperature gradient. Like in the solid, here at that solid liquid interface, the temperature is the melting point. Here, this is the temperature. Outside, you can control the temperature. The, here, the, this is at your control and you can control the heat extraction rate. So, this temperature gradient will determine that heat extraction rate and this and therefore, the movement of that solid liquid interface will depend on how fast you can that heat can be extracted and flow through this growing solid layer. And since that and in this case and the liquid basically is the melting point. So, basically this liquid some amount of heat when it comes out if it goes here. So, basically what you will find the temperature within the liquid it goes up. So, if this kind of temperature gradient is maintained in that case this and we have seen that solid liquid surface has a definite surface energy and it will always try to remain in the minimum state of energy. So, therefore, it is going to be straight. So, basically it is a stable interface a planar front which will move in this direction and this in fact because the heat is being extracted directionally crystal will grow in this direction. By this it is possible to grow even single by controlling this directional solidification it is possible to grow single crystals. Now, let us look at the structure of uh, 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 this uh, metal structure a little more detail. Let us look at that how the grains when you arrange the what way do they pack, what is their shape and what is the role of surface energy. Now, let us look at a 2 D structure, 2 dimensional grain structure. Say suppose we draw like this, say a hexagonal grain. By constructing this hexagon, you can fill up the space. Now, point is you can fill up the space by arranging square also but which will represent a proper microstructure. Now, here we have seen this boundary has some energy associated. Each of these boundary has some energy associated which is called surface tension. So, there has to be an equilibrium between the energy which is shown here. This is the green one sigma, sigma. I am putting it sigma because it is pure metal and the surface energy of pure metal it is let us say same. So, if it is same then this angle has to be 120 degree. So, therefore, it is not that the grain uh, surface energy of the crystal on every surface is same but the difference on the surface energy with respect to the orientation, the magnitude of this difference possibly is very small. So, therefore, whenever you look at it a 2D structure, simplest experiment to do is with a soap bubble. If you take a ring, put it in a soap water, take it out, you will find that soap bubble which forms that is a, a 2D structure, they all will be like regular hexagon and it maintains this equilibrium. So, depending if this grain boundaries energies are little different sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 then the, this will be slightly different, but this angles still will maintain I mean that equilibrium will still be maintained. So, it may be slightly less this angle this may be slightly more, but the forces must balance. Now, what happens in case 
of a three dimensional structure because metals the grains are arranged at random and that packing when you start packing it should fill up the space. Now, the best way to I mean people have done lot of experiments and making models have tried to fill up and the best way to fill up space is look at a octahedron. So, which has eight faces which is shown here. So, on the top surface 1, 2, 3, 4. So, this is 4 surface 4 at the bottom, but this if you try to pack you will not be able to fill up the space. Now, there are two criteria one is the space filling and second is the equilibrium of that that surface energy or surface tension equilibrium must be maintained. Now, when these surfaces they meet there will be a grain boundary and now in 3D say at it is quite likely that many places you will have one this, one this, one this. So, there will be four points like if you try and recollect that uh, carbon that bond structure in the four dimension if, if all these energies are nearly equal the angles have to be equal and I think we said that this angle is around 100 uh, 9 degree or something. So, to maintain I mean both this it should be a shape of the grain should be such that it should fill up the space at the same time wherever this uh, grains are meeting each other there will be these lines formed and you will have this wherever these four lines are meeting they should be at an angle around this. To satisfy this condition it has been found that the nearest it can do is a truncated octahedron. So, this is a octahedron and you truncate it like this. Similarly, this you truncate then you get a shape say something I mean I tried to show it here and this will have how many uh, 8 and then it has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 corners. So, 6 more faces will be added. So, 8 plus 6. So, it will have 14 faces. So, this kind of truncated octahedron if you pack which will nearly satisfy both this condition that means, space filling and balancing of the surface energy. And it will be interesting to also look at this uh, array a little carefully the 2 D array if you try and fill up. And here is an example shown here I have tried to put several polygon each touching each other. So, this is a space filling 2 D diagram space filling 2 D array. Now, some have 5 faces one has 6 another 4 over here. Now, when you pack them you generate number of edges they meet each other this is called grain boundary they meet each other. So, this will have one crystal arrangement say here these planes are arranged like this. So, here possibly the planes are arranged in a different way. So, if you move from one grain to the another the periodic array you know uh, crystal structure is still same, but its orientation is different the same planes are oriented differently. Now, you can count there are three I mean when you do this packing you also generate apart from edges number of corners where three or more than three grains meet like here the three grains are meeting. Similarly, there may be places here there are 1, 2, 3, 4 grains are meeting. So, you generate so in this figure you have a number of polygon that is p you have a certain number of edges e and you also have certain number of corner 
and there is a relationship if this is a space feeling there is a relationship like this which is looks like similar to that gibbs phase, phase rule that is p minus e plus c equal to 1 so this is an, this is true in a two dimensional case 2d case now in this particular case you try and count so now you have number of this grain this is 1 2 3 4 5 so number of polygon is 5 number of edges i have tried to mark here 1 2 3 4 5 6 so you go on marking so it comes out to be the last one is 19 so this is 19 so if you substitute here what you get is that c is 15 so that means you should have 15 corner now you count the corner this is 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 so you get that 15 corner so this is satisfied in a 2d array and this rule is quite general in fact there is an euler uh, law which is valid on surface of polyhedron like let us say truncated octahedron we talked about the truncated octahedron also you can apply this law p minus e plus c but e this will be equal to 2 here also in, in this uh, polyhedron also you will have number of faces corner and edges so therefore this can be applicable it's a very general this type of law is very general it can be applied to polyhedron and also now let us talk about the grain boundary a little more so we said that here is one grain here is another grain so what is the atomic arrangement along this interface called grain boundary so this is a boundary and i said that here crystal structure of this and this they are exactly same so what you do say suppose we generate an array the atomic array how does it look you can do it as an exercise and on a piece of paper if it you can take a transparent sheet and draw this atomic array at a regular interval maybe you take that closed pack plane you draw this closed pack plane like atomic array one sheet and you repeat you take a xerox copy of that on another transfer uh, another sheet and now on that transparent sheet you put on that and try and rotate rotate through certain angle and that means what you are doing you are trying to visualize what is the nature of array near the grain boundary so maybe part of it you say this that means you can can you generate this atomic array by rotating this grain so this kind of a planar uh, arrangement which is shown over here uh, it is called a coincidence uh, lattice concept i have drawn the same thing this is one grain where these atoms are arranged like this whereas in this grain the atoms are arranged in this fashion the same plane but it is a differently it is rotated now what happens at the grain boundary near the grain boundary few layer two or three layer what happens so this is the layer this is the one grain this is the other grain and you can say this is the grain boundary if you extend the lattice you will find that some of these points they are coincident with the lattice uh, with these lattice points so which are marked over here so this is a concept which represents the type of the grain boundary the nature of grain boundary people try to see on the degree of rotation and the coincidence lattice type of relationship so this is uh, um, i mean it is not that these atom are occupying this space you just superimpose and see what are their co coinc co uh, coincident lattice site and what you can find out this coincident lattice distance 
this is much significantly larger than this atomic distance. Like in this particular case, you see that uh, here th th this is one atomic distance. So, here it covers the distance, this distance is 1, 2, 3. So, that means this coincident lattice uh, dimension is 3 times the main lattice dimension. And by this, it is possible to relate and find out the surface energy or energy of the grain boundary and this energy has a relationship between this angular rotation between uh, to the neighboring grain and that is how the grain boundary energies are classified. And subsequently, as we go down, you will uh, find that uh, it is a very convenient way of classifying grain boundary. With this, we conclude today's lecture and in fact, uh, we have covered uh, this fully, the, this topic fully, we have We have talk uh, and next class we will begin a new chapter. Thank you very much.